Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Segundo, and I am a program officer at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and I am supporting the Roundtable on Plastics. Thank you so much for joining us today. The National Academies are hosting a Plastics 101 series of webinars as part of its ongoing activity, the Roundtable on Plastics. The topic of today's webinar is What are Plastics? where we will explore the history and future of plastics, as well as the science and implications for their fate. The next webinar in this series will be on October 17th, 2024 on plastic production and design. To register for these events, watch event recordings and stay up to date on roundtable activities, please navigate to the National Academy's project page on the Roundtable on Plastics. For today's session, we will be using Slido.com to manage our Q&A. You can access Slido.com using the widget on the event page, or you can navigate to Slido.com on a separate device and enter the code what are plastics, lowercase all one word. There will be a brief Q&A after each of our first two presentations, and then a longer Q&A for all three of our panelists in the second hour. That said, please begin entering questions at any time. Now, I'd like to hand things off to the co-chairs for the Roundtable on Plastics, Jenna Jambeck and LaShonda Corley. Jenna is the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Georgia. LaShonda is a Distinguished Professor of Engineering at the University of Delaware. Jenna? Thanks, Brittany. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jenna Jambeck, and I'm a Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Georgia and co-chair of the Plastics Roundtable with LaShonda Corley. I'm excited to welcome you to this first webinar in our webinar series. Plastic pollution is one of the most pressing issues of our time, from production to disposal. I had the honor of serving on the National Academy's Consensus Committee that produced the 2022 report reckoning with the U.S. role in global ocean plastic waste. Summarized in this report, the equivalent of a dump truck of plastic waste goes into our oceans every minute. Plastic is now found in almost every marine habitat from the ocean surface to deep sea sediments, as well as the Great Lakes. This report responded to a request in the bipartisan Save Our Seas 2.0 Act for a scientific synthesis in the role of the US, both in contributing to and responding to global ocean plastic waste. So we need to be more thoughtful about where, when, and how we use plastics. The National Academies Roundtable was formed after that report and provides a multi-sectoral forum for examining issues associated with the national efforts to reduce plastic pollution. Our roundtable activities cover all aspects of the plastics life cycle, examine potential interventions in plastic production, waste management, environmental and health impacts, and data collection management and modeling. The goal is to explore and advance systemic solutions and interventions across each stage of the life cycle, address the complexity and diversity of issues in reducing plastic waste, and catalyze the development of innovative solutions to plastic pollution. So now I would like to pass it over to LaShonda to provide her welcome and some further information. Hello, my name is LaShonda Corley. I'm a distinguished professor of material science and engineering and chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Delaware and director of the Center for Plastics Innovation. I am delighted to serve as co-chair of this plastics round table along with Jenna Jambeck. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the first installment of the Plastics 101 webinar series, What Are Plastics? As Jenna conveyed, society is at a really critical point um, to address the global challenge of plastics waste. The importance of this topic is underscored by the Biden-Harris administration's recent announcement of a new strategy to tackle plastic pollution. The NASM Plastics Roundtable is committed to communicating scientific concepts that are key to advancing systems level solutions across all aspects of advancing plastic sustainability. The committee has organized this webinar series to provide information not only to our roundtable participants who come from a wide variety of backgrounds, but also to the public, including the ability to ask questions and engage with our incredible panel of speakers. 
This What Are Plastics installment will feature experts to discuss the evolution of plastics in society and the science behind plastics, as well as end of life aspects. We are delighted to hear from our distinguished speakers and panelists and to enrich the discussion with questions from participants. I really um, hope that you will find this webinar both engaging and informative. With that, um, I'll introduce our first speaker. I'm thrilled to welcome our first speaker on the past and future of plastics, writer and sociologist, Rebecca Altman. Rebecca is an adjunct lecturer in environment and society in the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. Rebecca, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen here with you all and get things rolling. Okay. How are we? Are we good? Okay, well, thank you very much. It's it's lovely to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm going to do my best to kind of do almost 200 years of history in less than 20 minutes, and I'm going to try to do it in as visual a way as possible. So my uh, my co-presenter, um, Tim, this it's like dawn o'clock where he is, so I'm going to try not to be um, overly, overly heavy on the slides, more visuals. Okay. So I'm going to actually start the presentation. I'm going to I'm going to with uh, Dr. Jambeck's work with her uh, collaborators because it helps anchor our conversation today. So this is the 2017 publication from Science and uh, Science Advances that models uh, develops a model to estimate how many how much plastics was made in the period 1950 to to 2015. And I like this because it helps kind of set the stage for our, our conversation today and also helps lay out a timeline that I can both play with and extend. Um, so I'll just draw your attention to this graph. What you see here is the, the rise of plastics production across the latter half of the second of the 20th century. Uh, and here, the one of the graphs pulled from the supplemental material shows kind of the breakdown by sector. You can see the bottom half here is uh, the bottom blue is packaging. Um, and I'll just um, want to highlight some time pieces here. The first is that over, over this period, something like 8.3 million billion metric tons of plastic were made over this period, a uh, half of which was made since 2000. So I, I marked that there. And I wanna talk about the beginning time point, 1950, because it's often said uh, you know, in, in the media, the way that this got interpreted was that plastics began in 1950. Uh, and, and rather what I really wanna highlight today was that 1950 was both kind of a, a proxy measure that the scientists could, could work with to begin uh, modeling this because that's when we have kind of good globally aggregated data. Um, but rather 1950 is also an inflection point. Um, and to really understand the foundation of plastics, you have to go back um, uh, at least another, another century uh, into the past. And so where I'm gonna spend most of my time is focusing on the kind of a historical piece looking at these inflection point years that historians call the great acceleration. Um, and then we can use the, the Q&A later to talk about what's happening from kind of the start of the millennium forward. So I took I took their supplement of data and I kind of ran a quick um, crude chart myself so that you can see if you just look at this first 10 year period from 1950 1960 um, the you know even though they kind of at the 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 y axis kind of has to be collapsed to kind of capture that kind of kind of growth um, in their table here what you can see is that there was actually 4.4 uh, billion pounds of plastics produced that year and that doesn't come from nowhere so we have to really look. Uh, at kind of how did we get to the point where plastics could engage in that meteoric rise after that? Um, and so that's where I would like to take the conversation. Uh, so it's it's a kind of one of the kind of uh, understandings is the, the way in which World War II uh, and the investment and, and in plastics during that period and the infrastructure build out was kind of a carbon lock in for uh, for plastics. And that is indeed the case. Uh, here's just U.S. data that we have from the U.S. Tariff Commission. We know that U.S. plastics production, um, you know, it's a 200% increase in just a five-year period across the war. Um, here's a look at what kind of plastics that were being made in the U.S. in the lead up to the war. This is, again, U.S. Tariff Commission data. And what you see here is a map from uh, that was published by Modern Plastics that shows where the industry 
for primary polymer production was centered at the time. And what you'll notice is that Gulf Coast is not built out yet and that the industry is pre predominantly centered in Eastern uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Western Massachusetts, uh, with some development in Appalachia. You see uh, West Virginia Union Carbide, you see um, Tim's former employee at Eastman there in Tennessee, um, you see uh, Dow up in, in Michigan and you see another carbine, carb uh, carbon, a Union Carbide facility out there in uh, Indiana. What you'll also notice from the pie chart is the kinds of plastics that were being made in the U.S. in the lead up to the war were predominantly cellulosics and phenolics, you know, bakelites, essentially. And if you'll notice, there's like less than 1% of production was polystyrene in the United States at that time. And so part of what, what the change is, is, is kind of a change in what, what resins are being made. Um, but I do want to show that this was kind of an international phenomenon. Heading into World War II, every single enemy combatant had a Bakelite factory and was producing phenolics. Um, and so kind of here I made a crude map uh, to show you kind of just how many Bakelite factories were in the world at that point. Um, and it was predominantly coal-based feed materials uh, supplying those plastics. Germany was also predominantly using coal to make vinyls as well and would do so. Uh, I think the UK is Plastics production was also primarily coal, as it was in the U.S., um, and we can talk. We're going to talk a little bit about that conversion. Uh, there was massive polystyrene production going on. It began actually in Germany. Germany had scaled it uh, across the 30s, and there was the beginnings of polyethylene production uh, in the U.K. In fact. Um, production of polyethylene or polythene, as it was called at the time, then uh, began almost uh, exactly as German tanks breached the Polish border. So here are two of those facilities that are producing polyethylene and polystyrene at the time the war began. But what I really want to do is, is to kind of take you back into, uh, take you back a century to really look at the foundation for plastics technology uh, networks uses, because this is the foundation on which the whole edifice of the industry will be built later on. And so there's three trends um, I wanna talk about from this era. The, the kind of build out and industrialization of rubber and gutta percha, the build out industrialization of industrial cellulosics and the build out and industrialization of coal tar or synthetic based chemistry. The first it to look at is, is, is rubber. And, 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 and although it's called natural rubber, it is um, a semi-synthetic chemistry. Industrial chemistry is involved. Heat is involved in, in fundamentally altering what we now understand as the polymer structure. There are kind of principally two types of industrial rubbers that are developed. Um, one coming from, 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 from latex, predominantly sourced out of the Amazon basin, though eventually it is uh, cultivated on plantations. And then the other is kind of a isomer of that called gutta percha, which comes from Southeast Asia. Um, and the uses to which the, uh, these are put and the ways in which they uh, these polymers could be um, worked with, it could be anything from like a soft rubber, like hosing, um, or used to waterproof goods, all the way to kind of hard molded goods. And then that would be called hard rubber, ebonite, vulcanite. And they're used in all of the ways we would recognize today from medical equipment uh, to molded frames, um, Here's an advertisement from 1869 showing lots of different ways that this one company, the India Rubber Gutta Percha Company, uh, in 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 the UK was selling um, was selling rubber goods. The predominant use, though, that I really want to talk about is th the development of um, wire cabling, and it's one of the first massive industrial uses for particularly gutta percha and for rubber. Uh, less so than, than gutta percha. And, you know, if we think about kind of plastics use today as containers, here plastic was really functioning as a container for current. And one of the first ways current was used even before electricity was in, in telegraphy and in the development of um, te telegraph systems. And so gutta percha was used and modified in en masse by um, multiple different firms. Siemens was one in Germany. They laid telegraph networks from uh, London to India. They uh, laid the networks for the Russian and Prussian empires. Uh, shown here is the, is one of the companies that was working with Gutta Percha um, to lay the undersea telegraph connecting uh, Europe to North America. Um, just because I can't resist, some of the first marine entanglements that we have on record going back to the 19th century were in fact uh, whale strandings or whale kind of entanglements in these lines. Um, 
just to just to establish this was one of the most massive industries it was some of the first examples of global and multinational companies there were rubber barons uh you know steel's own andrew carnegie you know had once quipped i ought to have chosen rubber instead and i, I want i cannot underscore the scale at which this industry operated um what I show here on the screen is a 1916, actually advertorial published by US Rubber. And, and they're speaking of rubber in the ways that we speak about plastics now as having become so ubiquitous as to kind of fade into the background. Um, and what they tell you in this advertorial is just kind of the scale of their operations. This is just one rubber company, but they already had 35,000 global employees, exclusive of those that are working on their rubber plantations. They had 47 factories. And, and spending like 191 acres of manufacturing space. I mean, it's just a, a massive, a massive operation. And again, they're making everything from the belting that's carrying coals up out of the coal mines to the assembly line beltings that's sending Model T Fords down the line, um, hoses, gaskets, belts, military gear. There's kind of fascinating books about the use of rubber and the, the kind of rubber goods even strewn across the battlefields of the Civil War. Um, and then rubber would become increasingly important as warfare mechanized. So the second development that's happening across the 19th century is the development of cellulose. This includes the development of cellulose-based explosives like uh, dynamite, Alfred Nobel's dynamite, and gunpowder. But you also see them being developed into moldable materials, first in the UK uh, by Parks, um, who developed Parkinson's, but it did not commercially succeed. It did, however, commercially succeed in the United States with John Wesley Hylett's celluloid. Um, now, this did not come out of nowhere, though history often kind of argues about which one of these two men are the father of plastics and kind of focusing on fathers and founders and firsts kind of hides the fact that there was already a massive industry already making moldable materials in which there were already technologies for masticating rubber and compounding and molding. And, and Parks himself comes out of this tradition. So he comes out of rubber himself. Some of the telegraph uh, industry folks are the ones who in, who invest in Hyatt to build his massive production plant in Newark. So there is a continuum worth noting. So so we have the beginnings of a kind of a, a kind of a cellulose based um, plastics are going into molded goods, collars, cuffs, combs, teeth, um, and then the development of viscose rayon fiber and eventually films um, into paints, into coatings. Um, one of the most significant uses of cellulose eventually becomes film. And so modern photography, modern moving pictures, Hollywood itself, sometimes also just called celluloid, um, is one of the industries um, uh, that grow out of this. If Again, going back to the theme of container, we're not just containing current and signal, now we're containing memory and time, laying down si uh, you know, sound and, and memory in a whole new way. The third development that I wanted to focus on is the industrialization of coal tar chemistry. Um, and this is developing out of Europe. Um, and in particular, understanding the hydrocarbons that can be extracted from coal, the molecular manipulation of that, the synthesis of new molecules, and then the industrial development of potential products from this. The first were, were dyes uh, and then pharmaceuticals. Now, many of these same chemists in the lab were encountering polymers or what we'd understand as polymers, maybe even tinkering with them. Um, August Huffman shown here who had figured out how to get benzene out of coal tar also was mucking around uh, in like the 1840s with polystyrene, um, didn't really fully understand it yet. And it didn't come from an industrial source. It actually came from a uh, plant-based uh, little historical side note. But for the most part, um, the, the way this history proceeds is that these were kind of gunks and they were messing up lab glass and wasn't a priority at the time. So what happens during this period is you see the beginning of the theoretical foundations of the industry that will come and the empirical development of plastics, the technologies, the manipulation of polymers for performance, um, plasticizing solvent systems. Um, and you know, so you see the kind of parallel developments uh, across the 19th century leading to early 20th century development of Bakelite. So Bakelite is considered the first synthetic plastic. It is uh, kind of essentially uh, the a phenol formaldehyde plastic, phenol coming from uh, a coal, a, derived from coal. Uh, both of those were biocides of the era. They were used in the development of antiseptic surgeries. And so they're brought together here and they make a molding compound. Um, 
what's interesting about Bakelite, right, is this plastic comes online with other major inventions at the time, and they kind of carry each other together. So the development of electrical uh, uh, um, equipment. So GE, Westinghouse, some of the first purchasers of this kind of plastic, and also went on to become producers of this kind of plastic. Uh, cars were another early use that Bakelite and kind of kind of rode in together with, and then the wireless, the radio, um, another uh, another way in which what originally was an industrial material was eventually commercialized. Um, it's, it's the other thing I just want to point out here um, is what we see here is what kind of historians, particularly Bart Elmore, has called um, scavenger capitalism, the the use of the um, waste products of other industries. This happened with cotton to some extent, but here you see plastics tied um, to the steel industry because it is their coking ovens that are producing the byproducts from which the phenol is used to make Bakelite. And so this idea of a value added from a waste stream from another industry is already, that foundation is already laid at this point. So all of this production gets accelerated. Um, across World War I, and we move into the interwar period and kind of three things happen here. One is we see more kinds of plastics being invented. And so what is necessary is a way to talk about it as a category. Um, the Germans actually come up with the term Kunststoffe. It, it's a, a compound word to, that means kind of artificial material that develop, they start using that in 1911. Uh, but in, in, in English speaking countries, what ends up happening is we nominalize an adjective plastic meaning moldable and we try to turn it into a noun. And it, it didn't kind of, it was used for a while but it didn't stick and you see lots of different terminology messing around. We see resin, we see resinoid, even Bakeland himself, the developer of Bakelite couldn't figure out what to call these things. And the Brits in particular were, were kind of pretty unhappy with the term plastic. Even by 1929, one of their trade association magazines was like, you know, we need to come up with another name. And so they held a contest and the most ridiculous and wonderful names came pouring in, um, but plastics it is. Two other developments in this period is the German chemist uh, Hermann Staudinger comes out with a paper and um, kind of trying to begin to explain the chemical, the, the kind of theory of how uh, kind of molecules like polymers and plastics form. He will not receive the Nobel for this work uh, for another you know, over two decades. And so it was kind of quite controversial, but it took time for that idea to institutionalize and to shift kind of how polymers are made. Um, but that is already starting to take shape. The other big change is you see the beginnings of the conversion of the major feed material um, to petroleum, crude oil, gas. There are many origin points for this development. There are no one origin story for how petrochemistry begins. There's like four rivulets into this stream of history in the United States alone. The Russians were also doing some early work on oil chemistry. But here's one example, Union Carbide or what was then um, uh, Carbon and Carbide uh, purchased an old gas works along the Elk River in Clendenin, West Virginia. And what had been kind of off gas before they started capturing and using to develop uh, ethylene derivatives. Um, this was 1920, so we just hit the centennial of the petrochemical work that they were doing there. And what they were able to achieve within five years, they bought a World War I era chemical factory just down the river in, uh, on the Canal River um, in South Charleston, West Virginia. And there they create one of the first examples of, a, of what, like an integrated petrochemical plant. Um, it grew so big that they ended up taking over an island in the middle of the Canal. It's here they developed, uh, one of the places where vinyls was developed in the United States. And it was so significant that Fortune magazine sent none other than Ansel Adams to go photograph it in the lead up to World War, I, uh, World War II. What we see after that is Carbide starts doing kind of co-location development. And so the next one of the next plants they build is in Whiting, Indiana, and they build it because now they're right next to Standard Oil of Indiana. And so they're starting to kind of move forward a new way of producing um, both chemicals and plastics. So now we're to this idea of, of the 1950s. You know, we have networks of investment. We have uh, the, the, the government kind of really investing in, in plastics, um, particularly the militaries. And so what kinds of changes are happening here? Um, and I'm going to kind of talk about there being kind of four classes of changes that are going on in this period that historians call the Great Acceleration. You see these kind of like astronomical growth curves in other sectors. And that's which plastics are made, how, where, and for what. Okay, so we'll go through these pretty quickly. 
we'll see the post-war growth of polyethylene and polystyrene. And we can talk more about this in the Q&A if you want, because the World War II completely revolutionized both of those. And then you see the subsequent development uh, of high-density polyethylene and polypropylene, again, work that received a Nobel. You see this change over in, in feed material, more specifically from coal to crude uh, and gas. And, and a lot of this is part of the post-war redevelopment plan, the Marshall Plan is kind of pushing uh, development of, of, of petroleum-based refining uh, in, in, in Europe. And so there's a kind of new you know, refinery byproducts that are in need of development. And you also see this institutional, institutionalization and application of, of polymer theory. Um, even places like uh, England and Germany that had predominantly been making um, coal-based plastics are starting to switch over to crude and gas. You see more countries start to manufacture plastic. For example, plastics. For example, you see the Netherlands. There's some really interesting case studies done on on their post-war development. You see new corridors of plastics production open up where plants are made at a much bigger scale, and you have a kind of whole economy of scale issue developing. Um, this is when you see the development of what we today call Cancer Alley. Uh, so here, what you see are ads from a uh, trade magazine from 1947, 1948, kind of advertising the industry to come and purchase up the land uh, along the lower Mississippi corridor. Predominantly, the largest tracts of available land were former uh, plantations. Um, as um, and, and you see they're kind of luring uh, the kind of the ideas to develop this land with fr you know, friendly taxation policies. OK, so the last is kind of for what? And so there is this post-war building or rebuilding boom and construction materials. You see the kind of more housing tracks being built. Those houses need plastic materials or, or being built out with plastic materials and increasingly with appliances uh, inside of them. You see the packaging boom really take off. Um, and that's in part because, like, for example, in the, in the United States, two themes we could pull on is the development of the highway system and car culture with fast food kind of coming along with that. Um, and also an increasing trend, it was already running, but you see an increasing development of uh, change of how we're kind of packaging and purchasing food uh, from kind of food that was packaged on site to kind of prepackaged self-service supermarkets. And then all of the kinds of packaging materials that go into that kind of get picked off by plastics one by one, you know, the egg carton, uh, you know, the bread bag, the meat tray, all the way up to the Holy Grail of the supermarket, which was the war here in the 1980s over paper versus plastic. And then the other big shift during this era is, is from durables and kind of over kind of glass recyclables bottles into disposables. Um, and here's an example of this is a modern plastics editor uh, to kind of talking to the industry at two different time points uh, in the kind of mid 50s and then again in the early 60s. In, in the first case, what he is saying is, you know, the, the future of plastics is in disposable models uh, and, and to kind of move the industry away from like durables like Tupperware, which was one of the early uses of polyethylene into using, uh, you know, polyethylene to make um, kind of materials that are used once and then, and then repurchased. And then in this, the plastics industry uh, wasn't innovating here. They were following what steel was doing, what paper was doing with the development of disposables uh, already in those industries. And within a decade, um, he again uh, was addressing the industry and saying the happy day has arrived where plastics aren't so precious that they can be thrown away. In the minute that's remaining, I just want to reorient back to the graph that we began with. And so, you know, at some point we'll be talking more about what are the, what are the, you know, driving trends uh, kind of going forward um, in terms of kind of containerization, business, to, you know, business to business packaging, you know, primary, secondary, and tertiary packaging. But I just want to just leave you with one final point, which is that how we tell history matters. If we are to say, and this is the story that I get on my soapbox about, but we love talking about the beginning of celluloid as being, you know, beginning with John Wesley Hylett, or plastics beginning with celluloid and beginning with John Wesley Hyatt, and beginning with this idea that there was like a contest looking for a better replacement for a billiard ball to spare the poor, uh, you know, elephant who was no longer able to keep pace with the growth of billiards. And now this did happen. This wasn't plastics beginning. And there's consequences to, to telling the story because the way that this gets billed today is saying this was an environmental good. And it's one the, uh, the celluloid company in fact invested in. And here's an advertisement actually for teeth where they were talking about how celluloid was you know, saving you know, these charismatic mega 
you know, fauna in their in their native haunts, you know, will no longer be necessary to ransack the earth in pursuit of substances which are growing scarcer. And so you kind of see this idea today that there, if we go back to bio-based plastics, it is a necessary environmental good. But you have to say for whom? And this will be the final point I end on. Because cotton production uh, was a kind of a, a terribly extractive and racialized system. Um, one in which across the same period was becoming increasingly dependent on, and at the time, heavy metal uh, uh, pesticides and, and, and then also fertilizer use. And so there's kind of all kinds of human rights and human health issues just with raising that feed material as well. And then we can talk about the plasticizer and solvent systems with, with celluloid, there's camphor. And camphor came predominantly from Taiwan, where the human rights violations involved in the harvesting of camphor are legion, particularly with the displacement of the indigenous communities in the, in the, in the, uh, in the camphor forest there. And then again, the, the solvent system designed or that took that was both part of the rubber production and part of viscose ran was carbon disulfide. And it was involved in generations of worker health issues, massive worker health issues. Here's a telegram from Alice Hamilton dealing with an issue uh, of a rayon factory uh, in Delaware. And also these bio-based plastics, rubber, inc inclusive of rubber, inclusive of celluloid, are our first examples of fence line communities. And there are incredible historical examples. And the reason I say this was, is this, because long before plastics became disposable, long before they became a waste issue, they have always been an issue of human rights and human health, worker health and community health, and a system bound into toxics. And so that says today that, you know, just adds kind of a hundred years of data to the argument that we're still kind of working out today, particularly around what to do about plastics, is that we must address kind of the full system, not just them as a waste product, because they've always been kind of a, a bigger issue than that. And with that, I'll stop. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that excellent presentation. We have a few minutes for questions, which you can enter using Slido. Um, you can navigate to slido.com and enter hashtag what are plastics to join the conversation. So one of the first questions that we have is you alluded to this a bit in your um, talk, but maybe you can provide a couple of example or an example from how World War II contributed to the acceleration of plastics production when peace resumed. So you talked a little bit about it, but I know you mentioned that the Q&A would be a good time for you to ex expand that. Sure. Uh, let's take polystyrene as an example. Polystyrene became one of the first uh, plastics, kind of mass commodity plastics to really be used uh, in packaging, um, even though it's been replaced now by kind of polyethylene and the other the other classes. But, you know, like when I when I talk about plastics, I you know, this is polystyrene. This is a rubberized polystyrene. And I feel like this is World War II in a cup when I see it. And the reason why is that during World War II, you see a massive expansion of synthetic rubber. Germany was already there. They kind of developed uh, synthetic rubber ac across the 1930s as part of their four year plan to develop independence. Um, from kind of global supply chains in preparation of war. And, and they had a styrene-based rubber. Um, and when the United States joined the war and they didn't and kind of had, had trouble kind of accessing natural rubber supplies, they developed a crash program to build out synthetic rubber. Uh, the, the U.S. synthetic rubber program was kind of on par with the Manhattan Project in terms of like scale and in, a development of infrastructure to kind of make rubber at the level that was necessary for the war and what was needed again for that was styrene. So the government invested in all of these uh, styrene production facilities that after the war, you know, when rubber demand finally finally fell, you had the monomer finally being made en masse and, 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 and at a sufficient scale um, to then allow for polystyrene to take off. What's kind of interesting about this too, is you have the development of a rubberized polystyrene after or high impact polystyrene. Again, kind of, com, um, even though it's more of a, a polybutadiene rubber, but you see the kind of mixture of these materials afterwards. The thing that had been holding polystyrene back in the United States was just being able to scale that monomer production so that the infusion of cash uh, and investment coming in uh, 
really took that forward. There's this beautiful ad from that Dow came out with in 1944 that talked about how, you know, styrene was going to be honorably discharged from the war. Um, and, you know, Dow was one of the first companies to make styrene in this country um, and was kind of part of that. Remember that little, that little sliver of pie in the, in the pre, pre uh, World War II pie chart. I mean, that's kind of Dow and also Union Carbide who was buying styrene from Dow were the only companies making it. Um, and that, that landscape completely changed after the war. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, there is a question um, that you also um, alluded to at the very end about this uh, confluence of, you know, toxicity concerns, human health um, rights of, of people, um, humanity around plastics production. Um, and so one of the questions that we have here is, are there, during this kind of historical context of plastics, was there also a, um, a, a subset of people looking into the environmental or health impacts? Or can you talk a little bit about the history and maybe how we should be thinking about that for the future? I mean, I think the, um, if you want to look at the history of plastics, you look at the history of the communities and the workers that were involved and, and um, uh, we have examples of, of both. For example, there was um, the book I showed at the end about Silvertown, which was a East 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 End London factory producing rubber goods. It's one. It's kind of one of the first places women were were, were unionized. Karl Marx's daughter helped um, help that forward. But that is an argument both for workers' rights, but also for the larger community of Silvertown that we're dealing with the effluent and waste from this. Um, there's some very interesting um, community efforts up in Glasgow that, uh, with a chemical factory up there producing sulfur, the sulfur used to kind of vulcanize the rubber. Um, it, there's examples in New Jersey as cellular technologies spread out um, of, a of a factory that was actually using it to fix, uh, a, a, you, know, you know, kind of treat or coat some of the kind of bridles and other equipment you are used to ride horses, the major mode of transportation at the time. Um, and that factory just exploded because um, it's an incredibly explosive technology. Um, but also it was dealing with massive pollution into the to the railway river there. And the community was already, you know, late 1800s organizing against the expansion of this particular facility. So some of the best places to find this history are in the newspapers uh, covering these factories at the time. Um, and, you know, there's a phenomenal book by um, Dr. Paul Blank. I think he's at UCSF. The book is called Fake Silk. It's um, it's the history of carbon disulfide, uh, which is the solvent system used in viscose rayon and cellophane film, but also previously in earlier generations in rubber. And it is one of the most fantastic books that looks at the beginnings of the problems, not just with poly the, you know, the plastic itself, but with the system of toxics designed to hold it up. The same is true for like the history of heavy metals. Um, we know about the Minamata Convention. We think about it as one about mercury, but what Minamata was actually what was actually being made at Minamata was vinyl chloride, and it was part of the vinyl uh, vinyl industry. And mercury was part of the system that makes the you know the intermediate that makes the monomer that makes the polymer. And so it's you know and and so if you kind of look across history and think a little bit more broadly about what is a plastic and what is required to make it you can see these pockets of concern and activism uh, in a much wider wider context. It just requires kind of opening up the, the kind of aperture to see it. Um, so again, we want to uh, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. There are some additional questions that I hope that we'll be able to cover during our panel uh, discussion. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Our next speaker is Tim Long, um, the director for the Biodesign Center for Sustainable Macromolecular Materials and Manufacturing at Arizona State University. Tim will speak to us about the science of plastics. Tim. Tim, you're on mute. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes. All right, terrific. All right, let me go back. Okay, I think my wife wishes I was on mute a little more often, so here we go. Um, well, that was just an amazing lecture. 
Uh, so thank you to Rebecca for really showing the trajectory of, of the field of polymer science. Uh, and what my job to do in the next 20 minutes with you is to really put the science behind the plastic, right? And talk to us about, you know, what are plastics? And you might find out that, you know, plastics are way more complicated than we ever imagined, right? So what we think about is just a pure macromolecular structure in reality is, is really much more complex than that. So we've just seen this trajectory of, you know, 100 years when Staudinger first you know, kind of disclose the idea of a macromolecular structure, a repeating unit, a polymer, right? What lies ahead in the next 100 years? And I think that's what we really want to touch on is where is this field going? What have we learned from the past? And what have we not learned from the past? And that's what I want to describe to you in my time with you. Okay. So my name is Tim Long. Again, I'm from Arizona State University. I came to Arizona State to lead a center focused on sustainability, sustainable macromolecular materials and manufacturing. So hence, you're gonna see a big kind of lens of that right throughout my lecture. So I'm uh, speaking today from Phoenix, uh, which is the fifth largest city in the United States. And what inspires me is the fact that we generate a lot of waste every day, right? So if I visit the Phoenix Public Works, the amount of plastic, the amount of waste and the people that are standing next to the conveyor belt sorting through what we think we have recycled you know very efficiently right is very inspiring to me right and hopefully i'll describe some of that uh, you know kind of next hundred years of where that inspiration has really taken us it's 7 40 in the morning here in phoenix uh, so hopefully i am coherent uh, and we will talk about what the path of the future looks like as Rebecca mentioned to us, you know, in the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to generate many millions of pounds of plastic across this earth, right? Here's one of my students actually buried right in this sea of packaging plastic container. And we'll talk about what plastics are and, and really, you know, what, what is out there beyond just a simple plastic that we as a, as a general society might understand. So what I wanna do with you? Well, I wanna tell you what the difference is between a plastic and a polymer and maybe define that landscape for you, right? And maybe startle you a little bit in terms of this is a industry that is much more larger, much larger than you ever could have imagined. I also wanna introduce the idea of viscoelasticity, right? What are these properties? Why are they so useful? Why has our society grown to be so dependent on these you know, materials and will they ever go away? Is this, a, is this a problem that's gonna go away or is this something that we now have to kind of live with and why are these properties so desirable? And then thinking about the future, how do we make recycling decisions? How do we look at molecular topology, molecular morphology in terms of their influence on how we recycle something? And then finally, bio, 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 and bio. Right? What are the, these nuances or these next directions right, that we might begin to imagine on more sustainable types of solutions, more circular economies right, of polymers? Okay, so let me kind of link into Rebecca's lecture again and just kind of give you my perspective as a, as a chemist. Um, we are looking at this trajectory of plastics produced, right? tons, millions of metric tons since 1950. Rebecca nicely described this as an inflection point, which I absolutely love that, uh, that concept. In reality, this is not slowing down, right? This is not slowing down, even though in 1995, we were worried about sustainability back then. In 1998, I published my first paper focused on sustainability, and I suspect that LaShonda right, could also say the same thing about her own research. But we've had a lot of great recognition of Staudinger that you just heard about, 100 years, right, of this kind of understanding of a molecule, macromolecule. Ziegler and Nada receiving the Nobel Prize in the 60s for polyethylene and polypropylene. And again, these were researched and manufactured well before the bestowing of these Nobel Prizes. And then Degen, Degen putting some understanding about how that molecular structure moves, right, through a manufacturing process. And finally, right, Bob Grubbs, right, at Caltech, right, talking about new catalysis and new ways to make molecular structures much more efficiently, perhaps even much more green, right, in terms of their approach. So where are we today? Well, we're approaching one trillion pounds of plastics every year manufactured in the world. One trillion pounds. 
And I'd be willing to say to you that around 9%, 10% is the recycling rate in the United States. Has that changed since resin codes were introduced decades ago? Not necessarily, right? So we something is not right, right? We're, we need to relook at and refocus on the circularity, the value, right, of this waste stream. We also have to think about the fact that plastics are only one part of a macromolecular industry. And the other part of that industry is what we would just simply call the polymer industry. So let's talk about that difference, right? A plastic, what is that? Well, we just heard about that. It's plastic, uh, it's plasticity. We can reshape it, we can form it. And because of that, we have all kinds of containers and, and food packaging and all the beautiful things that we currently rely on, right? These are materials that are typically rigid. And in the scientific world, we call that a glass transition temperature where the onset of cooperative backbone segmental motion begins to occur. Most people would think about it as a softening point, right? They're not the same, but in reality, what's happening when you get to a certain temperature is they soften. So things like plastic utensils, bags, you know, hair clips, milk jugs, pipes, toys, it has infiltrated every nook and cranny of our homes and every nook and cranny of society. So plastic, I think just wanted you to understand, it's simply a rigid material. It can be reshaped with the application of temperature. Hence, we'll use the word thermoplastic, right, in most cases. Now we have the word polymer. What does the word polymer mean? Well, it means any macromolecular structure that has a repeating unit, poly and mer, repeating unit, many of those. And this is much more encompassing, right? This could include things like DNA, proteins, carbohydrates, uh, rubber tires on your car, the mattress foam that you sleep on, the adhesives or sealants that are used to, to seal your shower stall, the flooring, the paint. All of these things are based on a repeating unit, right? And that's the polymer industry. So the polymer industry is immense and it's much larger than what we just saw in the one trillion pounds of plastics right, every year. For example, if we look at polyurethane industry, right, these are the mattresses we sleep on or the cushions that we sit on, right, that foam industry, polyurethanes is the sixth largest family of polymers in the world today. How much of that do we recycle? I'd be willing to say a very low amount. So we need to look at across the entire polymer industry beyond the thermoplastic. So let me look very briefly at this uh, recycling code or resin code number one, polyethylene terephthalate. I worked at Eastman Chemical Company, right, in the late 90s when these codes were, came out. I can remember a conference room where we were jubilant over the fact that PET was number one. But it was number one. And why were we jubilant? Not because it was a resin code, because we were number one. Right? And at that time, Eastman was one of the largest manufacturers of PET. If we look at number two, right, High density polyethylene, HDPE, a melting point about 130 degrees C. It's a rigid thermoplastic. A polyethylene terephthalate has a melting point close to 250 degrees C. Right? But these are all transitions well above room temperature. And we recycle a little bit of that. Polyvinyl chloride, right? We just have heard about this in the United States, right? Vinyl chloride monomer and its consequences on the environment, right? PVC is not recyclable and people will try to move away from PVC, but it's certainly number three. It's one of the big thermoplastics, has a transition temperatures well above room temperature, low density polyethylene, linear low density polyethylene. All of these types of copolymer compositions and branch topologies are also available in very large volumes and hardly, hardly recycled. Polypropylene, again, why do we love it? Its melting point is 170 degrees C. It's a rigid thermoplastic. We use it as a bumper on the car. We use it as the yogurt cup that we use every morning when we have a yogurt from the, from the grocery store, right? These are made by thermoforming with manufacturing processes that generate a lot of waste. And there's many people like Pure Cycle and others working on polypropylene and its recyclability. Polystyrene, we all recognize styrofoam, and we also recognize the challenges associated with recycling that. And then finally, number seven is everything else. It's the polymer industry. And when I look at this, this even scares me, right? As a polymer chemist, we're putting many, many, many millions of pounds of products into resin code number seven. I would argue that it's time to change that, right? It's something we need to do. 
So when we look at polymers, they're ubiquitous, right? They're ubiquitous beyond the simple plastic. If we look at the industry, right? Uh, and Rebecca just showed cables, right? Electronics industry, the textile industry, the clothes that we wear, the membranes we use, the composites in our car, the carpets we walk on, automobiles we drive in, the energy we're generating with the wind turbine blade, the foams that we sleep in or insulate our homes in, right? All of these are contributing to a much larger polymer industry that you ever could imagine, right? We are now as a society very dependent on polymers. And I'd be willing to say that polymers are gonna stay around, but we need to think about the more circular pathway or the end of life for all of these different industries. All right, so let's get into the science just a little bit. These are uh, plastics are often called thermoplastics, again, because we are reshaping them and reprocessing them with the application of thermo, right, or heat, thermoplastics. They're typically reprocessable. So in the recycling world, you could say, yes, let's just simply collect them and continually recycle them. And many people believe, you know, that is the first, you know, kind of stage in the process, right? Let's simply do mechanical recycling. In reality, that should be done, right? However, molecules get a little unhappy, right, when you put a lot of heat on them. So we always have to be concerned about molecular weight changes or molecular structural changes, right, with the implication of heat, right, or processing into a new product. So mechanical recycling, wonderful for thermoplastics. And these thermoplastics are commonly used for all the things that we enjoy today, right? Very important. The other side of that world, that other bucket of materials, we would call thermosets. And you know, I always, when I teach this, I always say, look, you know, the, the molecules are set. It doesn't matter how much thermo you give them, they ain't moving, right? That's kind of the idea. In reality, historically, a resin, a liquid material would set. It would solidify with the application of thermo or heat. These are what are called chemically cross-linked systems. They're not thermally reprocessable. This is a molecular structure that's covalently bonded. And to break covalent bonds you know, is the only way to reprocess a thermal set. Now, this points to current directions. And what people are looking at are reprocessable thermal sets, dynamic covalent bonding, vitrimers, whole new areas of thermal set technology that would allow us to enjoy all the beautiful properties of thermosets, things like structural integrity and higher temperature applications. But now we can begin to think about a more circular or end of life strategy. So let's go into a little more science and let me just kind of give you, you know, the science behind the plastic. Um, this is a semi-crystalline morphology. What does the term morphology mean? It is a self-assembly of multiple chains. So things crystallize, they self-assemble, that symmetry of molecular structure, you know, brings those molecules together. We have a melting point, we have a TG. We just talked about polyethylene terephthalate. Every water bottle in the world was based on PET, right? And I can remember in the 1970s, transitioning from refilling glass bottles as a child, right, to plastic jugs. And I was pretty thankful for that. And as Rebecca mentioned, there was a lot of great advantages of that. No longer were people dropping bottles and having shrapnel go into the air with 60 PSI of pressure inside that bottle. So there was a lot of reasons, right, even from a, a transportation standpoint, the lighter weight, right, of these systems. So there's a lot of real, very important and very worthwhile reasons as to why we transitioned at that time. And we have all kinds of optically clear or opaque containers. I would bet in your shower stall today, you probably have these sitting on the shelf and in your refrigerator, you may have used, right, some of these containers in the past. Things can also be amorphous. If morphous means something that's not necessarily ordered, right? It's amorphous, the prefix A, no, no structure, right? And we're relying on entanglements. And I did show one demo today because I wanted to bring it on, right? Molecular structure really relies on the fact that these long chains are entangling for us, right? And that entanglement gives us all kinds of good properties. Let me point to one that's very common. This is called a retainer. And if you use a retainer or you've known somebody who's used a retainer, you're looking at an amorphous polymer composition. Optical clarity is important, right? And all kinds of desirable properties. How many retainers do we recycle today? I'll leave that out for a question we can discuss later, right? We also want to talk about the term viscoelasticity. Uh, this is a term, you know, that certainly, you know, people uh, like Ziegler and Natta and Dejen and Robert, Robert Grubb, Bob Grubbs, 
they all enjoyed, right? Properties of polymers are both liquids and solids. Let me show it to you in terms of this data. This is modulus versus time. Modulus is stiffness. And because they're viscoelastic, we have a storage modulus and a loss modulus, or we have a solid-like modulus and a liquid-like modulus. The red one starts out higher, right? It's liquid-like, right? It's more important of the two moduli of a polymer. It's uncross-linked, for example, in this kind of demonstration here. And then I'm gonna shine some light on something, and I'm going to now make a thermal set, okay? And this is commonly done. It's commonly done in the 3D printing world today. Right? And we convert a liquid into a solid. And now the black curve, the solid-like or storage modulus, now exceeds that of the liquid-like uh, modulus. These crossing polymers, as we talked about, are very rigid. They're structurally sound. And they're very useful. And now people are looking at ways to make them more reversible or recyclable. Let me give you one example of where a thermoplastic right, kind of has seen its penetration into the recycling world. This video actually comes from a circular plastics microfactory here in Phoenix. Uh, this is the Goodwill, right? So we know Goodwill in the United States is recycling things all the time. Now are now looking at converting waste plastic into usable items. This is being done at the Goodwill. And this is what we would call a very democratized recycling scenario, right? where essentially we are recycling at the point of collection, right? We're not shipping it somewhere else. We're taking it in our own communities, right? And we're recycling them in some way. And Goodwill is, I think here in Phoenix is really leading the way in terms of mechanical recycling. Again, we're mechanically recycling a thermal plastic. And many people will say, this is the first, row, first line of attack in terms of reusing or circularizing, right? The waste stream. The second term, this is Clarissa in my lab, setting up a, a chemical recycling strategy. And what is she doing? Well, she's taking a molecule there on the upper left, right? And she's putting a catalyst and some solvent, maybe in a heat, and she's converting it back to the monomers itself. So chemical recycling is a way to bring back the garbage to the starting material. And it allows us to purify that starting material and recreate a brand new polymer product. So we can take that polyethylene terephthalate cup, we can chop it up, I can put it, we can put it into a reactor system, and we can convert it back to its monomer. Is this happening at a large scale? Of course it is, right? People are looking very widely at this in France, Eastman Chemical Company, right, has led the way in looking at the recycling of PET back to dimethyl terephthalate, right, one of the monomers that we use to make polyesters, right? Many people, NREL, our National Renewable Energy Laboratory here in Golden, Colorado, is looking at the recycling of PET using volatile catalysts and a solvent called ethylene glycol, which is the other monomer used to make PET. And they're doing that in a very viable and commercially viable strategy. The other big approach, and I think Rebecca touched on this too, is how do we take garbage and valorize it? And I was really intrigued by her point that, yeah, this was done a long time ago, right? That was kind of interesting uh, to me. Uh, and we're looking at that even today. Like, how do we take garbage and refine it back to the starting material? So in the case of polyethylene terephthalate, resin code number one, PET, right? It's produced at, you know, millions of metric tons per year. Huge industry, $39 billion industry, the third most common polymer in the, in the industry today. We can, con we can convert it quantitatively back to the monomer. Right, so that is a ex beautiful example, right, of a chemical recycling, a valorization, right, of a waste stream. And then using this bis hydroxyethyl terephthalate as a monomer for other things, right? Let's make polyurethanes out of it. Let's install ester groups because now we have the potential to introduce recyclability sites that are coming from our garbage itself, right? And I think that's a mindset, right, that we have to think about is how do we use those? All right, how do I go a little bit longer? Plastics are even more complicated than we imagine. They can be multi-layer structures. Let's take this ketchup bottle, right? And let's complicate the industry even more. Let's make layers of tie layers and regrind and oxygen barrier layers. And, and let's, let's satisfy our consumers, right? That are demanding so much of this industry, but now we're complicating the industry and now even recycling of very complex compositions like a multi-layer package, right, are exceptionally challenging. How do we address that, right? That's a major challenge in the future. Multi-layered things 
also are important to us, right? They're used in, in purification of water, reverse osmosis membranes, for example. They're used in purification of waste streams. We don't necessarily think about the recyclability of those, right? So there's many instances now where the polymer industry, not only the plastic industry, but the polymer industry has moved into very sophisticated technologies where future technologies are heavily dependent upon. Can we remove them? I would argue it would be very challenging to do that, right? I was just up in the company, I uh, seen a company, Boston Scientific up in Minneapolis. We're not gonna remove many of the polymers that are used in the healthcare industry today, right? So it's challenging for us to think about it. And then as we even think further, I did a quick search on all the different additives used in polymers. And we use additives to enhance performance and further satisfy our consumers, right? Things like plasticizers, phthalates, and we all know those have been in the, in the news for a long time in terms of being a serious you know, kind of health consequence. Most recently, adding surfactants or processing aids, you know, perfluorinated octyl sulfonic acid, right, for example, right? These are all things that have emerged, right, in some ways to help make products better and maybe use less energy and process these more efficiently. But there's many critical issues uh, maybe the most of which is toxicity, right? That we all are currently kind of struggling with as an industry and we're looking for alternatives. But composites and additives are important. Think of solar panels. Solar panels are composite structures from all kinds of layers. Are we gonna do away with them? Probably not, but we need to think about their safety, uh, how we construct them, their end of life, how we recycle them. And we have to ensure that we're not using perfluorinated alkyl substances or fluorinated polymers, perhaps, right? And we have to look at end-of-life strategies now for some of the existing technologies that we're currently imposing. All right, in the last minute or so, I know, LaShonda, I'm getting close, um, is we want to use, our, we want to take advantage of an understanding of where these end up in our, in our world. And microplastics, you know, as we get smaller and smaller and smaller, the materials that are entering our world today are at the nanoscale. This is about the size of a strand, double strand of DNA, right? So we know, right, that this is an absolutely critical issue for us. And Rebecca mentioned earlier, this isn't a new issue. And I totally agree with that. There's publications from the 60s that really describe the ingestion of plastic into fish, right? So it's not something new, right? And we have to rethink this linear traditional manufacturing process into a more circularized, circularized process. So in the last three slides, I promise, I went, maybe I went a little bit too long. I'm sorry, LaShonda, you know how I am, right? Um, we can think about nature's biopolymers. There's many, and at UDEL, right? Uh, University of Delaware, LaShonda, Thomas, Epps, you know, leading the way in this, in this space, but looking at what nature gives us, right? In terms of all these different polymers, we just heard about cis polyisoprene, you know, natural rubber, but all the different carbohydrates, proteins, and DNAs, right, that, that nature gives us. We also understand the difference between bio-derived and biodegradable. Bio-derived, yeah, we got it from biology. There's glucose. We use that as a monomer, right? Biodegradable, here's polycaprolactone, right, synthesized by humans, but also simply biodegradable, right, under the right conditions. And those conditions can be quite controlled. It could be light, it could be enzymes, it could be hydrolysis, it could be microorganisms. So there's many different pathways that we're looking at now as a scientific community, right, to begin to reimagine or redefine the polymer industry. I'd be willing to say that we're using polymers from 1931. We're using polymers that Wallace Carruthers described in a patent in 1931. And here we are almost 100 years later we're using the same polymers that were not designed for end of life. Now is the time for us to rethink, right, the polymer industry. Rethink what nature gives us. In this case, again, Thomas and LaShonda, like looking at, you know, biomass derived monomers, right? Things from lignin, things from, you know, turpentine, things, molecules that nature has provided us for a long time. And we need to think about those things. And finally, in the last point, is that nature also does things perfectly. There's a reason why the cactus survives here in Phoenix, right? It's porous. There's a reason why the bones in our legs are not solid so we can walk. We can begin to think about consuming less by using a form factor, right? To kind of accommodate less material. And this is a big research area right now, right? Very, very common. Look at the beehive. How does that 
inspire us to think about new directions in materials. So finally, my last slide, we simply need to consume less. And one way for us to do that is begin to think about what nature has told us in terms of how to more carefully use materials, right? How to more carefully use them and design materials that perhaps are latticed and can be processed even to the shape of carbon. So we're looking at ways to do added manufacturing, looking at ways to do 3D printing. We're redefining, right, the polymer plastic, you know, kind of factory of the future, right? And that's something that I think is really coming forward. So finally, I guess I wanna say again, thank you to the National Academy. Thank you, Lashanta. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I'll leave you with this Steve Jobs quote and I'm hoping for some really cool questions. So welcome that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, we do have just a few moments for questions, which you can enter again using Slido. Navigate to slido.com and enter hashtag what are plastics to join the conversation. So I, I'll start with one question. Um, so Tim, how do you describe plastics to a 12 year old? Ah, that's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> good question. You know, I people will often use the idea of spaghetti, mm -hmm. right? And but I personally am not a spaghetti fan. I mean, I love eating spaghetti, but I don't think it necessarily defines what a polymer is. I usually use a bucket of snakes, LaShonda. Even though I don't like snakes, they accurate, more accurately, I think, depict what a macromolecular structure is because they reptate, they move with heat, they entangle, right? And I think that is how I just describe that to a 12-year-old is that these are big molecules, much like a ball of yarn, right? Very entangled. And this entanglement is what makes macromolecules so unique, right? It's, it's what differentiates polymers from small molecules. And I think that entanglement is one of our favorite words, right? So... I think that's how I would do it. I hope that does it. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, so another question um, or a series of questions, but I think they're quite interrelated is um, you talked a little bit about biodegradable and compostable plastics, um, but how do these and other emerging trends in the polymer realm um, really affect uh, plastic materials and their applications and of course, recyclability? So maybe you can expound upon some of the points that you raised during your talk. Yeah, so you know, when I think of things that are biodegradable, I'm thinking about, okay, they degrade into our environment and hopefully those species that they degrade to, the environment doesn't mind. You know, the ecosystem that it's in is receptive of them. That's not always the case. If we throw soybean oil into the ocean, I'm not sure a fish is used to eating soybean oil. So we have to be a little careful about the idea of biodegradation and how we use that term. In fact, many people don't like that term these days because it really means it's degrading to something and it really depends on the ecosystem that it ultimately ends up. But I think it's an important pathway for us. I think it's a way for us to imagine that if something does find its place into the environment, it is going to break down, right? It will break down to something that that ecosystem will tolerate or our human body will tolerate. I go to microplastics in our body. Here I'm in the, you know, in Phoenix, we have a Mayo Clinic. We're fortunate to have it. Many physicians feel that the microplastic in our body is causing health issues, right? So we need to understand that, right? But we need to understand that if we can design polymers that do degrade into something that our body, our ecosystem can tolerate, then I think that's an important pathway. So biodegradation, composting, I, I think it's a critical component of, you know, kind of next steps in the development of the industry. Great. Um, and maybe last question here is, um, so why, um, why should we be investing or thinking about commercial scale chemical recycling of PET as opposed to um, low value plastics or multi-layer plastics when there's already a market for mechanical recycling of PET? Yeah, that is an absolutely wonderful question. I mean, the answer is, you know, if I was talking to Kate Beers at NIST, she would tell me immediately, the first step is to do mechanical recycling. But we have to remember that plastics are molecules and molecules age with heat and time, just like we do, right? So we can do the mechanical recycling to a certain extent, but at some point, we're gonna to get to the place where recycling no longer works. We're getting a product now that's inferior you know, to what we expect for a package, for example. So we, at some point to circularize that economy, we need to go back to the starting material. We've asked as much as we can ask, right, from the molecules, and then we have to do something a little bit different. 
And I think there's a big effort. The one that strikes me uh, most recently, a very hot topic is textiles. Uh, textile recycling is, is a huge area of research right now across our country, across the world, right? So looking at that and how we can recycle textiles is a good example, right, of where eventually we got to go to a chemical recycling strategy as those molecules start to degrade. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Tim, for your great presentation. And now I'd like um, to welcome both of our speakers, um, Rebecca and Tim, to join us for a panel with Jill Martin, who is the Global Sustainability Fellow at Dow. Um, and Jill, I'd like to um, offer you a few minutes to speak about your work. I think we, you're muted, Joe. I'm good, I'm good, yeah, good. So now I get to say something again. Uh, so thanks, Tim and Rebecca. I have more questions for you than we'll have time for in the panel, but I wanna go back to the snake uh, metaphor, Tim, and say I find that much more relevant because they're all different sizes and shapes and that's the way uh, polymers are, different sizes and shapes. So thanks for helping in that teaching moment going forward. Uh, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time in talking about our um, DAO's Transform the Waste Goal. And I'll do that by, again, trying to hit some of the highlights of the slide that I'm sharing with you today. And if we think about the Transform the Waste goal, again, this aligns to overall what we are investing in, in terms of partnerships, um, new technologies, and obviously how we're engaging with the broader value chain and supply chain for plastics and for polymers. So just as a point of clarification, certainly um, the business that I sit in, the polyethylene business is the largest business in Dow, but we do also manufacture materials that go into the polyurethanes end markets like automotive, as well as into the acrylics. So coatings for fabrics, for example, as well as in labels. Um, so we do cover quite a broad range of materials and applications. And our strategy is certainly intended to address the opportunities for transforming the waste across those market segments. So while I represent the polyethylene business in my discussion today, um, what we are doing is certainly going to be impactful um, across all those materials sectors. So there's a, a couple of things that I wanna come back to, and we didn't talk about it too much here, um, but I, I do wanna emphasize as part of our strategy, we are looking at the decarbonization uh, potential for um, not only our existing assets, but the assets we're building in the future. We have a planned up in the Alberta, Canada area, which is our net zero or path to zero strategy going forward. Again, you hear a lot about um, decarbonization strategies. This is very critical for us in our manufacturing processes, not only to reduce emissions, but also to provide lower product carbon footprints uh, for the products that we put into the marketplace and overall allow the brand owners to decarbonize themselves. Um, so it's a very active space for us. And again, it's a transformational opportunity from an asset strategy investment. But we're actually spending quite a lot of time in investing in new technologies. And this would be in both the mechanical recycling space, as well as what we call chemical or advanced recycling. And two of those that I want to point out are, again, the dissolution program, as well as gasification. We announced earlier this year a partnership with P&G in the space of dissolution, targeting hard to recycle plastics with the intent to recover polyethylene. Um, so again, investing in new technologies is a critical part of what we're doing going forward. And that's not just in the U.S., it's global. Um, and so those partnerships are not only about technology, but they're also about waste collection programs and activating those at the local level. Um, so this means where we have more of a waste picker community in areas like Southeast Asia, India, and Brazil, that we're also working very closely with those companies to make sure that we enable that workforce to again, determine what the materials are going forward. So they understand, is it, am I picking the right bottle out of this system? You know, how do they actually benefit from having that opportunity to participate in obviously a space where we need to be focused in the um, minimization of plastic going into the environment today. So the other thing that I'll talk about here is, again, when I mentioned WM and I mentioned PNG, that's the direct partnerships that we have, but we're also investing through the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, as well as with Delterra and the closed loop partners in many different technologies that are not necessarily Dow technologies, but these are startup companies. Um, and again, those are global in nature and those companies can bring novel solutions in terms of data collection. Um, they can bring novel solutions in terms of end market development. Certainly textiles is high on the priority list as well as plastic packaging. 
And it's also an opportunity for us to invest in early stage technologies that help us to better delineate materials that can be easily recycled by mechanical processes, as well as those that are better suited for chemical recycling or advanced recycling technologies. And those sortation technologies and the incorporation of digital tools, machine learning, AI will be extremely critical for us to identify, again, what value the waste streams we are targeting will have in the end markets for those. Because without the end market pull through, and this means not just um, in the packaging space, but in many of the sectors that both Tim and Rebecca talked about, we won't actually be able to create circularity for plastics. We need to have all of the end markets, whether they're, again, supporting the growth and the energy economy that we see, whether it's solar or wind, or even the existing economies that we talk about, like the transportation sector, the packaging sector, and of course the healthcare sector. So all of those are very important to create a broad circular economy for plastics, and it's not just one size fits all. I wanna reflect very briefly back on the comment that Tim made regarding again, and I think that Rebecca said this as well, two things. One is that when we talk about economy of scale for any of these solutions, we recognize that that will have to grow. But we also recognize that some of these may just be within a community, it may just be Phoenix, for example. It may just be the Goodwill store at Phoenix. It may be just somebody in Brazil, maybe somebody just in Sao Paulo that's putting that together. And supporting those is equally important because it helps us catalyze more investments along those lines. It's the proof of concept of these technologies and these ecosystems that at the end of the day are going to be truly transformative in terms of creating um, a circular economy, but also addressing the plastic pollution um, issue that we're talking about today and going forward. So I, I wanna end there because I know we're running a little bit late. I again, appreciate the invitation to work with this team again. I said this when we met last week, it's so good to see people that I've had excellent conversations with, challenging conversations, really in-depth conversations, as well as to meet um, new people like Rebecca. So I'll stop there and thank you again, Lashonda. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jill. I'll open up questions to the entire panel, um, although this one I think Jill may align well with the things that you just talked about. How can we foster collaboration among industry, academia, and policymakers to develop innovative solutions across the entire life cycle of plastics for enhancing circularity and sustainability? Yeah, I think there are a lot of really good examples out there where we see that happening. And certainly I'd just give a, a little bit of a shout out to you and the team as well as to others that are um, working with the government to set up centers that are focused on how do we address new innovative technologies. And then of course those centers are engaging industry partners, right? So we're developing at low TRLs in order to get those to the scales that are appropriate for the materials as well as the technology going forward. Um, the alliance that I mentioned before, Alliance and Plastic Waste, for those of you less familiar with it, is another example. I keep using the word catalytic capital, where Dow and I think it's about 40 other companies have come together to not only um, support technologies that we ourselves would implement as far as our asset strategy is concerned, but also building out, again, capabilities in multiple geographies. So it started actually in Southeast Asia as an example, and now is expanded into the Americas to make sure that we are looking at those opportunities on a global basis. So I, I see this as, you know, again, good collaboration across the value chain. So it's not just Dow, it's Dow's customers, it's Dow's customers' customers. It's of course our university partnerships that allow us to really, again, foster that innovation, look for those ideal solutions going forward. And of course, it's the support of the government, because without the government helping in policy and funding, at the end of the day, it will be probably under-resourced, underfunded, and we need to make sure that we have those public-private partnerships really at the front and center of addressing this problem. Thank you. Um, another question I'll open up um, to everyone is, what is something you wish most people or the general public better understood about plastics? Mm -hmm. I can start out. Um, I think the community needs to understand that there's, you know, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? I mean, their plastics are saving lives, right? We have artificial hips because of them, for example, and there's cardiovascular devices because of them. So those are good things. I think right now society is kind of inundated with the microplastics, you know, which they should be, which I'm not minimizing that issue whatsoever. Um, 
um, but it's that's pretty much on the forefront of their mind. So I, I can go down into a into a community and I'll see shirts that say plastics kill, like literally written on the shirt. Uh, and I think that's a perception that we as scientists, you know, as an engineers, we need to really communicate, right, the, you know, the benefits and the challenges associated with polymers. I think that that's important. I also think we need to encourage recycling. Uh, how we do that, all right, that could be debated. But I think right now, even when I walk outside and try to put something in my recycling bin, I'm confused, right? And I, I teach it. Right. So it's, it's really challenging. So I think we as a society have to make it easier. As scientists, we need to make recycling easier. Right. And I think that's something that if we could educate the, the community on, that would be a, a good thing, too. So if no one else has a response to that, I, I do have another question that is a great segue from the, your comment about recycling, Tim. Um, thinking from, from a historical perspective, when did plastic recycling technology develop and why? I, I can start out now. I'm sure Jill and Rebecca chime in. My first patent at Eastman Chemical Company is recycling polyethylene naphthalate. So rather than PET, it was PEN. Why did we do that? We did that for cost reasons. Right? We did not do it because the N monomer was expensive and there was no way we could commercialize that molecule unless we recovered it, right? So a lot of the early you know, kind of green chemistry and sustainability, I think Rebecca, you might've mentioned it, was really driven by a business model. It was driven by cost. It wasn't really driven by our, by our passion to make the world you know, more clean and better. It was really driven by a cost-effective business model. So it's been around for decades and decades, but that's what, at least from my experience, really motivated us early on uh, to look at recycling. I can chime in and say too, there's historical examples of the, so quote unquote, natural rubber industry setting up uh, rubber recycling plants for latex-based rubbers, 19th century. Um, ag again, to try to kind of uh, address issues in the supply chain, um, particularly at that kind of influx moment where rubber went from wild harvested or harvested um, it, it kind of through in, 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 increasingly um, even genocidal regimes um, uh, in like the Amazon or in the Congo, uh, in, in King Leopold II's uh, uh, holding the Congo um, before it was kind of created into plantation systems where there's just monopoly control over the rubber, you see increasing efforts to deal with the supply chain issues through recycling. Um, I think the other point that I, I think that ties into this question and the one before it, I mean, I, I, I see this constant individualization of plastics uh, in, in terms of in, in consumer products and the focus on and consumers doing a better job. Um, and I think there's a lot of kind of uh, social forces that um, kind of focus on plastics as a as a litter problem and one to be addressed through, for example, anti-littering campaigns, which developed in the 50s um, uh, and translating into um, kind of teaching better ecological behavior by fine consume plastics, just go ahead and recycle them and not dealing with the kind of larger systemic issues that are creating plastics and putting them into systems such that consumer choice is not even uh, an issue anymore in, in terms of whether that good can be buyed with, bought without uh, plastic. You see this happening today with sachets, sachets like the little plastic, the, the kind of way the single serving size are getting reduced down so that in places where bulk product, uh, bulk sales were possible, now you're buying like this. And so I'm, I really just want to, I always like to keep the conversation focused um, on the kind of collective issues and the systems that are pushing pushing plastics on, onto consumers or thinking about like the collective levels of consumption, which are companies, which are which are plastics primary consumers, not on actual individual consumers uh, themselves, uh, who are have constrained choice within that system. Maybe a maybe a point of like clarification on the kind of recycling aspect of things, and I know we focused right away on recycling, and this somewhat reflects on what Rebecca just said about the the way we manage materials as a whole, right? So we we have recycled aluminum, we have recycled glass, we have recycled paper for a very long time and effectively and have those rates up at very high levels because we've continued to make it straightforward for people to do that. And to Tim's point, we spent a lot of time in industry looking at post-industrial recycling for 
um, the point that you mentioned to make sure that we are reducing our waste and reducing the costs associated with that. I think when you start to, to Rebecca's point, put the post-consumer or post-commercial recyclet into the picture, then it becomes more complicated um, because you're asking collectives, so people live, living within small areas, to do the same thing um, with materials, so everything treated the same way. It's relatively straightforward with paper because it's monolithic. It's straightforward with aluminum cans. It's straightforward with plastic. Those are monolithic. But then plastics are a little bit different, as Tim talked about. So again, part of this is saying, can we fit plastics into the system? And what plastics should we fit into the system? And you know, how much can we focus on designing for circularity? And we broaden that context of, is it just recycling or is it reuse? Is it material minimization? This is, I think, the maybe that pivot that we need to take here and say, you know, we we have to to a certain extent treat plastics a little bit differently because the use of those is again can be very much at a, a personal level, but they are also very diverse in terms of their composition. So how we deal with the materials that we could reuse and recycle might be a little bit different than the established processes today. And so that's where the innovation sits. But I hear you, Rebecca. Absolutely. Um Definitely great highlights there. Um, from an educational standpoint, you know, there's a question about what are some solutions taking place that to solve some of these issues around reuse, redesign, recycle um, that we can share with students who are very concerned about the impact of plastics on the environment and climate change in general. I can start out, you know, from educational, you know. I think what we need to do is train our students and our workforce differently. We have to get away from the mindset that we're training a PhD in chemistry or a PhD in biology or a PhD in chemical engineering. We got to train a circular thinker. We got to train a circular designer. We have to train someone that can speak multiple languages of science and engineering and they're infusing circularity and principles of green chemistry and everything that they do, right? So it becomes part of the fabric of every degree. So I think I think we need to change the disciplinary nature of the way we train and be even more interdisciplinary in our approach. So let's start with that. Fantastic. Just a comment on that too. And, and Lashanda, somebody and Tim, both of you who have applied for multiple grants recently, right? There's a, there is the component of education and DEI. And I think having the government actually ask us as researchers to be thinking about how do we actually educate undergraduates or even get into the communities and educate 12 year olds as a case in point, I think that's an extremely important activation system for us. If we're going to invest in deep science, we better make sure we're investing in the future scientists that could be again, 10 or 12 year olds, you just don't know. I've gone into classrooms and I've talked to students about plastics and those who are actually paying attention, you know, had good questions. You know, and again, you have to recognize that uh, you have to meet people where they are. So five-year-olds are different than 12-year-olds who are different than 18-year-olds. And so how do you make them engage in the process of thinking about, to start with recycling, you know, if you have a question and you think it's not recyclable, please don't put it into the recycling bin because that makes the problem downstream harder. So teaching them by showing them um, engaging them in activities that are appropriate for the age level. It's the same for science as a whole. If you can get to that level of engagement, you will have people that you know, are circular by nature um, instead of waiting for people that own a house or buy a car to all of a sudden have a switch flip and be ready to go. And Rebecca, what do you think here? I mean, I'm I'm pretty interested in in providing basic education on what plastics are and reminding um, reminding students of their human origins because uh, once we understand plastics as a human creation, we can understand them as potential objects of human recreation and working within communities, uh, you know, in sectors to figure out what uh, better polymers and better plastics would look like. Front and center, you know, uh, end users who are requiring safe products and communities that are requiring safe processes, same with workers. Um, I do think that, you know, the education piece that I think is most critical and that's happening right now is, is broadening the perspective of plastics from just a material and waste issue to one that is a larger issue of uh, 
human health and human rights. Uh, and so, uh, and then students are particularly um, wanting to think about plastics and on that level uh, of a material system. Um, and to begin to think about solutions that are adjuncts to recycling, because recycling taps one bit of it, but doesn't deal with the microplastics piece or the toxics piece or the community and uh, human health piece. Uh, Wonderful. I think that you know each response really highlighted the interconnectedness of the question and that there are many levels to how we engage and use with plastics, how we think about it, how we educate the communities, um, even in our school system. So thank you all for that. Um, the next question is really more about another question about chemical recycling. Um, and so Tim, I know in your presentation, you talked about additives and other um, components uh, in plastic materials, right? So what happens to these during chemical recycling? For example, if you um, use chemical recycling for a container that has pesticides or other types of materials in them, what happens? Yeah, I mean, if you don't do anything, they will go downstream, right? So that's a big concern, right? And so there's, there's a couple different ways to go after it. One, we can clean the container. Right? We can carefully clean it and we can do all the analytics and kind of in situ analytics to make sure we did that properly. Right, So there's ways to, to simply clean. What I'd like to say is that we should remove them. <laughs> right, We should begin to think about what we call like monomaterialization, where we essentially are asking our producers not to use that phthalate or not to use that surfactant. Look at different ways to get the performance our consumers want but don't put them in there to begin with. I think that that's a big challenge. Now, having said that, a lot of people are looking at like the textile industry, you know, we remove, you know, 5% of the dye out of every shirt that we try to recycle, right? Because those shirts are beautifully colored, blue or green or whatever color, right? And how do we recover those dyes? They're very expensive, right? So looking at ways to reclaim the additive, yes, we're, we're definitely trying to do that, right? Through different chemical processes but we're also looking at ways to remove them, right, in some situations and how to, how to make the, the waste streams easier to handle. So hopefully that gives a little bit of thought to it. I don't know if anyone else had a response, but if not, we will move on to the next question which is um, what's the most interesting or surprising fact or piece of information that you've ever learned about plastic? So Rebecca, I was really intrigued by your talk and learning um, all of the historical significance and the interconnections with history and people. Um, but I'm sure many of you have uh, an answer to this response. I, you know what, so I don't know. I, it's, I was trying to think about this because I was looking at the question ahead of time, LaShonda, and thinking maybe I'm jaded uh, and not jaded in a bad way, but I think I've been here, you know, I've worked for now for 30 years, but I studied polymers as an undergraduate. I started a recycling program when I was a teenager. It's not that I would say I'm surprised by anything um, necessarily. I'm intrigued by what you can do with them. And I would say it's more what we could do on the redesign that I find most interesting, right? It's not the looking backward, it's the looking forward. And, you know, how do we marry together the chemistry principles and the performance and use that we need to have? Because we talk about this a lot. We say, hey, there's this brand new polymer. It's going to replace polyethylene. I'm like, great. You know, how much does it cost to make? And um, does it have the same opacity? Does it ha have the same tensile strength? Does it have the same barrier? ah, you know, I haven't tested that yet. And I said, okay, so here's some things that we could do to help you kind of target what it needs to do to replace some of these other materials that are in the market. So I really am intrigued more by what people are thinking about they could do to produce material that is, again, back to the whole circular by design, you know, looking at additives and everything else. That's what is more intriguing to me is how we get there. Um, like I said, not looking backward, but looking forward. So great. I can I can shine. Rebecca, do you want to go ahead and I'll join, follow you? I can, please. Thank I, you. I think, you know what surprises me um, is how popular they have come to become, 
you know, I think about the industry, I look at the chart that Rebecca showed, it's not slowing down, right? So the polymer industry continues to grow, impact the quality and quantity of our lives. And I think most scientists would be surprised at just how pervasive they are today. I mean, I am, right? I can't look around my office without seeing, you know, 50% of everything is based on a polymer, right? I mean, so that to me is surprising. It's also motivating that we as scientists need to now think about depolymerization as opposed to polymerization, right? So it's a completely different mindset. And I think it's because the technology has become so powerful and pervasive. And that's, I think that's what surprised me is just how powerful and pervasive it really is. I, uh, I am under no illusion about the critical nature of plastics, right? I have a kid who carries epinephrine and I have a kid who wears hearing aids. I, I can't be more grateful for those two items. I'm also the daughter of a plastics maker. My dad made uh, high impact polystyrene for Union Carbide. In fact, at that original New Jersey Bakelite plant. And in 2013, after Dow had bought it, he and I went and watched part of those buildings get knocked down. And uh, I've been incredibly grateful to be on this journey with him deep into the history of plastics. Mm -hmm. Two surprises. One is how incredibly interconnected the history of plastics is to the 20th century. You can you can almost tell the entire history through plastics. It's it's kind of phenomenal. Uh, they're undergirding everything, for for better or worse. Typically both. It's usually an and an both situation. Um, but the second piece that I think is really critical is that there has been a constant request from the public to do it better, mm -hmm. and it has been there from the beginning. Nineteenth century requests to make them better and safer. And long before it was a waste issue, the waste issue is critical and has hit into tipping points of kind of planetary scale. Uh, and we don't even fully understand the implications for human health yet. But there has been a constant cadence of requests to make plastics safer for workers, for consumers, and for communities. Um, so, I mean, I, I just I couldn't believe how far back that went, which is all the way to the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all for um, wonderful responses and really uh, thoughtful ways that we can consider um, the impact of plastics on, on our lives and then how we are in how we are interacting and in encouraging uh, change related to that. Um, one of the questions, one of the next questions, is really kind of this interconnection of um, the rise of things like single-use plastics in, say, the food industry. How can we revert some of the cost of plastic pollution um, that's driven by this use and say the food people, um, I think the question referred to McDonald's and Wendy's of the world. How can we transition some of that cost to the actual um, McDonald's and Wendy's of the world? So these food chains, thinking about policy, um, drive by consumers for something different. Any thoughts on that? I'll start out, and Lashonda, I think I'll, I'll start with what you just said. I think consumers have to demand it, mm -hmm. right? And I think that will be what ultimately changes our business models is the fact that your customer wants it and your customer prefers it and your customer will buy it because you have, you have been committed to stewardship of your products. I mean, this is kind of what the industry is moving towards is basically, can you lease a plastic? Like you're going to use it, but ultimately it has to be returned. Right. It's not a, it's not a linear. It's, it's a circular thing. And we use it as the feedstock for the next generation polymer industry. No longer are we taking things from the ground and making them. We're taking things from our garbage and feeding it into our plants. Right. So that has to be it's a different mindset. Uh, people are starting to do that with PET. You know, they're bring, making PBT. So I think it's a stewardship of the companies, this idea of leasing a plastic. And I think consumers need to demand it. Um, you know, society needs to ask for that with their with their pocketbook, you know, with their money. Uh, I think that's key. Maybe talk a little bit about policy. And I don't know if you were thinking about EPR here, Lashonda, with the question, but certainly that's been front and center in a lot of conversations is how do we use extended producer responsibility to help drive, a, again, the circularity of systems? How do we use that to fund what needs to be in place to 
again, look at what are the right waste collection systems. If we get into a different material choice, Tim, for example, if we start to look at McDonald's and quick serve in general, using compostable, do we have the infrastructure for compostable? And how do we use EPR to do that? So you have the composting facilities and that there's value for the composters when they actually make that material. So I think that, you know, again, EPR is one way to be thinking about driving that. Um, one of the things that Dow talks about a lot is that you know, it has to be fair, which means that everybody in the value chain benefits from it, not just one producer or another. It has to be flexible, which means that it's applied to all materials. Um, so when we're thinking about a circular economy, we're talking about a circular economy for all materials. We're not talking about just plastics. Um, and so again, the fair and flexible aspect of EPR needs to be in place, and we are definitely 100% supportive of that. I think one of the things, just to kind of come back to Tim's comment, is that we are seeing that the states are doing sort of their own thing, because that's who we are in the U.S. We do our own thing. And so we are coming up with EPR systems, if you don't mind me using that word, for um, what would happen in Indiana versus in Oregon versus in California. And we have a, a lot of materials crossing over state lines. And so how do we look at, again, policies that allow those states to recognize that some materials do transfer, transfer over the borders? And how do we accommodate what happens again with those materials that come in versus, you know, how do you actually address what's happening in California when you produce in Missouri, for example? Europe is a pretty good model for this, um, right? We always look at Europe in this respect. And so learning from what's working and learning from what's not working um, will be extremely critical for us. I remember there was a concept reading one of the IPCC reports. It wasn't about plastics, it was about climate, but it was about the, the need for the provision of goods and services. And what would it look like to provide those goods and services, but dematerialize them or think around the materials or the um, assumptions that are going into it? And so like there's a scene from this, the movie about the founding of McDonald's starring Michael Keaton as Ray Kroc, you know, and, and he's approaching um, one of the first roadside stands for burgers um, and, and he's handed, a, you know, a disposable cup and a burger and a bag. And he's like, where do I eat it? And he acts out this like moment of, just absolute stunning. Like, I have no idea what to do with this. There's no tables, there's no utensils. And, and the purveyor of the goods has to explain to him, just go sit in your car and eat it. Um, and so I think like, it's even worth kind of going back a step and asking, okay, what are the goods and services that need to be provided here? And is, is a plastic the right one for it? I mean, maybe for some answers, the answer is yes. And the, or could a better plastic be designed for that? But is plastic the answer to uh, the provision of fast meals? I don't know. Um, what are other ways around that to provide goods and service, uh, services absent? It's, it's just worth asking the question every time it comes up, um, because I think the default has been, well, if you're going to package an egg or you're going to you know, have a bag, you know, we got to a point where we stopped asking the question of how did we get to the place where even just the question paper or plastic is no longer even asked at a supermarket checkout? Like, you know, that's not the case now, but, you know, 10 years ago it was. And so, you know, these bigger questions are kind of worth worth asking. Um, and to always embed the question in the social system that is driving that choice in the first place, which is the development of consumer culture of fast foods, the development of a supermarket as the way that food is purchased, you know, long range transport of food, you know, as necessitating light waiting in the first place. A food system can change and you therefore don't need light waiting in the same way. I'm speaking in broad generalizations, just as kind of to be provocative and to kind of provide that broader question of how do we provide goods and services? You know, hey, Lashonda, you know, one thing I'll just throw out there, a very common issue right now on the West Coast in, in regions like Arizona, right, where we don't have a lot of water, is the idea of using artificial turf. Mm -hmm. Look at artificial turf, right, that is in California, there, there's opportunities to actually, you know, maybe ask people not to use, you know, artificial turf. But then there's also communities that are like, well, it's saving water and we're not putting pesticides down. So there's this debate of whether rolling plastic onto our lawns, right, is a good thing or a bad thing. And I think one thing we need to think about is, you know, life cycle analysis, right, Jill? I mean, like understanding techno-economic analysis. Don't look at it simply, look at it holistically and understand, right, the system and the economics. And I think those tools are becoming more and more usable. Would you say, Jill? I mean, I, I think they are, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I, I think maybe one of the, 
um, changes that we've seen is that people would say, yes, yes, we use LCA to make decisions about what products that we use. And I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about corporations. As we began to really probe a little bit more on that, we found that it was sort of a little bit of a, well, the data over here, say the data over here. And now it's again, light switch moment here, Tim, where we're seeing more and more people being employed to do the life cycle uh, assessments because then they better understand the choices that they're making. I think the part of this question as we come back to the consumer is, but how do you convey that to a consumer? I did this life cycle assessment. Here's the LCA, here's the product carbon footprint. How do you actually help the consumers make data-driven decisions, right? So this is that balance between their beliefs and their understanding. And how do you make sure that people have the information that helps them make decisions? Back to your point, Rebecca, about dematerialization. Choose what makes the most sense, not just for you, but for the environment, if that's the way you're motivated. And getting the data across to people has been a challenge because you can't put on, you know, 20% less carbon onto a shampoo bottle. It's not, it's not helpful, mm -hmm. right? Wonderful. Thank you very much for those um, answers. Uh, another question is while plastics are essential in many areas, it's crucial to explore alternatives such as other materials like glass or paper, alternative designs like a solid shampoo bar and behavioral change. So reuse and refill. Um, could you discuss the importance of these options, especially in the context of um, plastic properties? Um, so Jill, you mentioned about performance and you know redesign for a new polyethylene. You know, how do we think about those things? I spoke last, but I'll give it a shot. I think this whole reuse concept um, is uh, is intriguing because we've. For the most part, seeing a lot of the a lot of reuse models, I think I'm going to get the name of it wrong, but I think it was called Loop, right? Was looking at it in San Francisco and New York. Do I have that name right? Um, and it was, you know, again, delivering products in containers to people, reclaiming the containers and bringing them back to the consumers full, right? So there was the idea of reusing those containers, and obviously very important for those to be in protective containers, so they were typically more metal-based containers. Um, so then, you know, that's that's been a program that's had some fit for a consumer, let's say, demographic. Um, but I think that, you know, when we start to look at, let's say, flexible packaging, you start to look at what Amazon's trying to do, right, in terms of how do they deal with the amount of material that they're shipping out with the products, how do they continue to protect it, but how do they assure the consumer that they're thinking about those mailers in terms of how do we actually reuse those mailers? How do you reuse those mailers? You know, what are the ways that we could do that? So we're seeing, you know, the food and beverage industry, we're seeing the e-commerce industries grappling with it, trialing these models of reuse in the context of I shipped you something and now I want it back or here's how you could reuse it if you can't recycle it, for example. So I, I'm kind of excited about it, but I think it comes back to what's the right design for that particular package that went out there so that you could easily reuse it. Again, a rigid container, easy to reuse. Flexible, maybe not so much, right? So we still have a lot of cool design opportunities in front of us for those containers um, that we put out into the marketplace today. Won't even talk about transportation. I'll punt that over to somebody else, but uh, Rebecca, you talked about that as well. My favorite chapter on the history of bottles uh, is buried in the middle of Bart Elmore's book, Citizen Coke. He's an environmental historian. I think he's at The Ohio State. That book is fantastic. But the history of how we went from glass to plastic, uh, he's working with American Beverage Association documents to tell that story. It is so well done. And the piece that's missing now is kind of these kind of, which is is about diff diffuse production, um, decentralized production. And then these kind of, I don't like the term, middlemen folk who were in charge of bottling and collection. And those jobs are kind of gone as that that industry was centralized. So it has to do with the, the kind of the layout of the bigger distribution systems. I highly recommend that book. I think it's really, really interesting. But you see that too with waste collection. I mean, there is a whole industry. It, it had its own name. It was called the Shemraji movement or Kemraji movement. It's all pre-World War II, all based on trying to collect ag waste, farm waste, and try to turn it into plastics. I mean, there's a huge historical precedent. It, it, it kind of didn't make it past World War II at, because the feed materials going into plastics changed. And if, if oil and gas are, are subsidized, now you have a whole different economics of kind of what to use as the base material. Material. Um, 
Uh, and so there, there's all these really interesting historical examples of these systems being in place and making it or not. Um, and and I think I think it's worth kind of knowing about those as these new systems kind of we try to develop them again. Um, there's 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 a lot to 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 collaborate on with historians of this work. I think um, they find very interesting. So there's a question around uh, considering the definition of plastic, of a plastic material. Um, what is the checklist for consumers to understand that will support um, claims that are made about products being plastic free, right? So how do we um, designations where people will say things that they're plastic free or they're biodegradable or they're compostable? How does a consumer really know what that means um, and how to treat that in terms of plastic sustainability? That is a challenge. <laughs> you know, I, I even think of like, you know, let's make something out of paper, right? But at the end of the day, we need some kind of adhesive that holds the cellulosic fibers together. So is it truly polymer free, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think it's a really, really challenging question. Like, you know, how do we communicate that to the community, to people? Wow, I mean, do we have some way to, I mean, I'm a firm believer that we should redefine our resin codes on the bottom of every container. Right, we should redefine what we're telling the community. We're telling them something too simple and to a certain extent is misleading because number seven is you know, horrific, right? So I think we might wanna think about how we communicate to people in terms of our packages. Uh, what is the carbon footprint, right, Jill? I mean, a lot of consumers are asking that now, you know, what is the carbon footprint? But I think that kind of communication needs to be redefined and, and clarified to answer Lashonda's you know, kind of poignant question. I think it's it's a good one. I I have to imagine that um, there is a huge amount of research being done, not just at the CPG companies, but also in social science areas, looking at consumer responses to certain messages. And I I would say you know, my conversations there aren't again. Many, but my my sense is that that's still I would call almost like a science that's being formulated, where we are better able to understand what consumers would respond to if they were going to be messaged on sustainability. I think recycled content is something that has, again, not to harp only on recycling, seems to resonate with consumers. They get it, but then you know again back to your point, Tim, the the chasing arrows is not a recycling code, right? It's only a designation of the type of material it actually doesn't tell you that you should recycle it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of this is trying to test consumers and then also to monitor their behavior of the consumers. If you say, this is what you should do with it, here are some suggestions. There are so many different channels than there were in the 70s when those chasing arrow symbols were created you have much more opportunities through social media media and QR codes to help consumers understand this. And so again, thinking about meeting people where they are in terms of communicating benefits of any type of package or any type of material is much different enterprise than it was when we could only rely on the facing of the article that somebody bought. So I, I'd say the social science aspect of things is something we definitely should monitor. I don't know that there's an answer, but I would expect that as more and more solutions to plastic pollution are coming into the marketplace today that we will find hopefully a confluence between that kind of communication to the consumer and also the solution that's um, again viable for them. So there is a question about um, why can't resin codes also be QR, be, uh, QR codes, right? And so I do believe that there is a, a movement of, of thinking about doing that. Right. Um, I some nodding of, of heads. Um, so I do think that this kind of social science and then technology innovations are also allowing us to transition to that point. If anyone has anything to say about that, um, feel free. Um, one, we're almost at the very end. I do wanna ask one uh, last, uh, hopefully um, major question here around, um, what can you do to help decrease climate anxiety in the younger generation? specifically related to the impact of plastics in the environment? The heavy question, right? <laughs> uh, 
I'll start out. I think we need to educate them, right? We need to educate in terminology that's understandable. We need to provide opportunities for students, you know, to have a, a research experience or to be involved at the local community college or, or the universities, right? Get involved, right? Learn more. I think I think that's that's important. I think that that's going to be a the first step is just to increase awareness and educate. I mean, most of the younger kids I know, you know, think plastics are bad. Like, why am I working in that field? That's a horrible field to be working in, right? So I think we need to educate and we need to understand that you know, little steps, little changes, removing a straw, you know, not having a lid, like little things make a difference, right? L little steps equal major leaps. And I think that's something that we could communicate to some of the younger, you know, kind of, you know, children in our communities. I think there's a huge component of do um, for education. This is the experiential learning process that we always talk about that most people learn better when they do something and thinking about, you know, how do you, what are, what are some things that you could, could do um, as an individual to further your, again, understanding of the choices that you're making. And so I, I think there's a lot of the um, opportunities. Again, I talked about this before where we say, you know, you could learn about these materials, but you could also do something. Here's some things you could do. Again, you could use less of this. You could make this choice versus that choice. You could recycle better. Again, keep coming back to that. Maybe just a quick story and then Rebecca, I'll give you the floor here. But um, I was at a university in Austria probably about five or six years ago, and I was at the polymer, uh, in the polymer department. And they told me that they were having a really hard time recruiting students because their parents had told them the plastics industry was going to just go away, that there were no opportunities. And I said, if you're not in the middle of it, working on the solutions, as a scientist and engineer, I can think of no better place to be than at the center of the problem, not on the outside trying to throw stuff in, but in the center trying to develop something that works better. So I, I think it's really acknowledging it's a hard thing to do, but setting people up to be excited about solving those hard problems, not just kind of saying it's a problem and wringing their hands. That's not going to be helpful. Right? We need to get people engaged and wanting to be a part of whatever they can do at whatever age and stage they are. I agree wholeheartedly with all of that. And and then I, I also just remind, you know, you can participate in the system as a consumer, you can participate in the system as a scientist, and you can participate in the system as a citizen. And I think the questions that are on the table right now are questions of reduction of primary polymers, um, which is, at, you know, at the level of the UN, um, and dealing with plastics as part of what is being called the triple planetary crisis. And so to work on plastics and addressing production is to address climate. Um, and young people are are wanting to be politically active on this issue and to exercise uh, a relationship to this industry other than being a consumer. They are consumers. They want to be consumers. They may even want to participate in making the industry better. Um, but there's there's multiple panel uh, pathways and channels for doing that. And um, so I you know just to provide an alternate perspective on that as well. Um, That's wonderful. Um, it if there's one person who can respond to this last question, um, what is the environmental cost uh, or chemical cost of materials used um, in the context of paper, glass, plastic metals, including recycling, and how can we shift the conversation to a more holistic view of material needs of society balanced by the impact on the planet, right? So can we think about alternative types of use of these other materials in the context of our environment? Jill, this sounds like you. <laughs> I was going to say it sounds like you. Actually, <laughs> back to I mean, this to me, and I, I think of environmental costs and just coming back to this life cycle assessment tool, right? So you're comparing, and if I understood the question correctly, I'm not sure I did, but that's the way I, I'm thinking about it. when I think about the environmental cost. I'm thinking about it from a what is the impact from a a again global warming potential, eutrophication, all the indicators that an LCA really pulls out, right? Because it's not just about carbon, it's about other impacts as well. 
Um, so I'd say if, if we're using, and I'm going to come back, LaShonda, to something we talked about at the power conference back in July, right? If we're using the same methods of accounting, whether we're talking about LCA or we're talking about mass balance, then we have a system that people can trust to saying, yes, this is the environmental impact of XYZ solution. Um, so that, that would be my answer. I, and I'm going to stop right there. Wonderful. Um, so I just want to thank all of our panelists for your very thoughtful perspectives. And we extend our gratitude to the audience and broader community for their engagement today. I will tell you that there's still a, lots of questions um, from the community. So this has been a very lively discussion and I hope over the next set of um, webinars, we'll continue the conversation. Our next webinar in the series will be on October 17th on plastics production and design to register for these events um, and to watch event recordings and stay up to date on the activities of our round table, please navigate um, to the website that was listed um, on the slides in the very beginning and that you'll have um, from where you register. Um, again, on behalf of myself uh, and Jenna and the National Academies, we really, really appreciate your participation today and the lively discussion. And it leaves us all with something to think about as we um, continue our conversation about Plastics 101. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Have you. Great Nice to meet you all.